from the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I'm joined today by Buzzy Cohen. Hi Sarah, thanks to the miracles of time, space, technology, <laughs> we've talked about the weird uh, intra-space time continuum that we live in here in the pod. I am actually speaking to you from a beach in the northeast of Brazil. So podcast producer Alexa, could you cue some rolling waves and some ah, uh, yes. seagulls for me? Yes. Take oh, yeah. Mm. That's where I am. I feel it. Yeah, you know, we have Jeopardy airtime. We have <laughs> Jeopardy production time. The same thing happens with the pod. And listen, folks, as much as we love this podcast, we thought perhaps, you know, the day after Christmas and maybe in the <laughs> middle of Buzzy's travels, we wouldn't exactly record. So this may have been recorded a bit earlier, but right now I'm still in the holiday You're spirit. Pull, don't pull back the curtain I'm too much, still Sarah. still in the holiday so, spirit. So holiday spirit, tell me about how your family celebrated Christmas. Well, we do celebrate Christmas. We spent it with my family in Palm Desert. Ooh. Two girls had some, some lists for Santa. They were all checked off. Thankfully, I guess they were indeed nice and not naughty. <laughs> and it's just nice to have a bit of downtime. You know, yeah. the show's not taping right now. And just everyone needs that family time. I yeah. hope Brazil is proving to be just as enjoyable. Yeah. Well, I don't want to spill the beans too much because I want to send people to my social media to keep up ah, with my okay. viaging. Yes. yes. Do you guys do more of a Christmas Eve or a Christmas day? I know that's always a, 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 a contentious thing. It's sort of the yes. pineapple on pizza of Christmas celebrations. Oh, you know, we kind of do both. We okay. do a big Christmas Eve dinner. Mm -hmm. um, we go to a church service, but we don't do a lot of presents on Christmas Eve, much okay. to the kids' uh, chagrin. But on Christmas Day, we have all the gifts, all the festivities, but we also do a big meal on Christmas as well. So a mm. lot of cooking going on um, in a 24-hour span and therefore a lot of eating. But fun, had oh, by all, love and it. eggnog, big eggnog oh, in, okay. the, uh, in the Foss house. Yeah. I <laughs> recently heard from someone who uh, was invited to the White House holiday party that they make the eggnog with Abraham Lincoln's eggnog recipe. Okay, that's amazing. And it is apparently like jet fuel, like you can only have one. So uh, <laughs> I will try to get that so we can post that Abraham Lincoln's eggnog That would be eggnog great. My recipe. mom's recipe Pretty close to Jeff yeah. Hill as well. Uh, a little fresh nutmeg on Ooh, top. It's, it's nice nutmeg. and uh, puts you right in the holiday spirit. I have been told that nutmeg is one of the secret ingredients in Coca-Cola. Um, I've heard that. And they grow a ton of nutmeg on Grenada, okay. an island I visited. And that's apparently why, like, no matter what happens, Grenada's economy, although it's not great, will always be okay because they always need nutmeg for coca-cola there we go now i know uh brazilian <laughs> hanukkah not traditional not but, traditional uh, no you know yeah. how, do, how do you celebrate we kind of did a little bit of hanukkah before we got on the plane and then we we've done a little bit as we go a little you know treating here and there but yes. kind of low-key but we are we're gearing up for a big brazilian new year's which is a big thing down here so um speaking of oh new year's got any resolutions oh, are you a res gosh. are you a resolutor you know not so much, but I'll, I'll get in the spirit. Yeah, talk to me. You know, with the kids at night, sometimes my face washing, teeth brushing routine, mm. it skips once in a while, and that can't happen. So yeah. I got to go 365 days of face washing, teeth brushing at night. That's what okay. I'm going for. I love that. Mm -hmm. I'm a big skincare person, so we can talk about what our routines are, but yeah. you can't miss it. I will say, I mean, I would like to get on the television show Jeopardy this year. Ah. Oh. Well, I think I see a couple of challenges. A couple that. of challenges, but you know, yes. I like to set a big lofty goal for myself. Okay. Isn't uh, Inside Jeopardy enough, Buzzy? Aren't you so never Inside enough. Jeopardy that you don't even need to be on it again? I guess so. Maybe I'll have to come up with a better resolution. Yeah. I'll well, work on you it. You know what? We have a week to think about it. So maybe. We do. By the time next week yes. rolls around and I'll be <laughs> we'll calling be, from another Brazilian beach. We'll uh, be day two into our resolutions yes. and we will have already failed ourselves. Yes. But let's, let's do it anyway. Well, anyway. Enough of that. Enough of our <laughs> yammering. Today's show is a very special one. Since we started the podcast, we've received innumerable questions about the Clue Crew. And 
if there'll be a reunion of sorts to pay tribute. Well, I'm excited to say that later in the show, you'll get to hear my conversation with Sarah and her Clue crew partner, Jimmy McGuire, about their time shooting Clues around the world for 21 seasons. And there was so much to talk about that we decided to release the interview in two parts. So please stick around for part one of our conversation. Yes, we had to break it up into two. That's yeah. how much content Buzzy just brought out of us. It was a blast <laughs> chatting with you and Jimmy and just getting to look back at my time with the Clue Crew, getting to share those memories. So I hope all of you enjoy that as well. But first, we do have some games to discuss. This is our final game recap of 2022. So cue the beep boops. All right, we kicked off the week with Ray Lalonde, Andrew Schmidt, and Miranda Omnin. What a game this was. I mean, I think Ray came out of the gate very strong, really showed a lot of buzzer dominance in the Jeopardy round, Very only one incorrect, continued that in the double Jeopardy round, finishing up uh, with a runaway, a big, big runaway. You know, it's hard to have too much gameplay stuff to talk about when it's really, at that point, the Ray show. Yeah, his third win, but we did learn something interesting. He has an identical twin brother who's Ooh. also in the process of auditioning for Jeopardy. I don't know, I just had thoughts of, like, kids in school who would play pranks on their teachers. And yes. And who's to say it's Ray up there? Maybe yeah. it's his brother. Like, maybe he's pulling it all, pulling it over on us. But whoever it is, Ray or his twin brother, great Jeopardy player. Going into <laughs> final, they came up with a clue about my favorite candy. If anyone wants to know, yeah. Milk Duds, my favorite candy. Yeah. And interestingly enough, Miranda was the only one to get it correct. Mm. And she said that the way she came up with the response was she was looking for synonyms of flawed names. Like mm. Instead of going to the candy, she went to synonyms right. for a flaw. And that's how she came up with Milk Duds. So, you know, she said, there's hints in there. You just yes. got to find the hints. And she was able to do so. Yeah. Couldn't pull off a win. But hey, I think it's a win when you're the only one who gets final correct. Absolutely. You can hold your head high. Yes, you can. All right. Moving on to Tuesday's show with Ray Lalonde, Kim Agard, and Jason Radelin. This one had a little bit more of a, you know, a little bit more of a game. Um, even uh, third place going into final, Jason could have doubled and beaten where Ray was at 20,100. So Kim right in the middle there at 14,800. It was one of those, it's going to come down to final. And this was a final that everybody missed. Yes, it was Here Comes Santa Claus was the correct response. Ray was on the right track. He went with Santa Claus's coming to town, which is a lot to write down yeah. <laughs> in that amount of time. But it really was a little bit of a tricky final. Ken did mention in the post game that, you know, one way to study for Jeopardy is to think about when your shows are airing. And right. so you think about, okay, this is the week of Christmas. Yes. There could be some holiday clues. Keeping that in mind that that he had heard that a lot of players look at their air dates when they're coming into yep. tape. Because, again, you're not... It's not Christmas when they're here. You totally. know, it's months in advance. So to look at your air dates and try to see what the writers may be writing about with the holidays in mind. We did have yes. the Dr. Seuss baking challenge category, <laughs> and that was fun. Podcast yeah. producer Carlos and I went over to the set. They filmed it right here on the Sony lot. Oh, my gosh. And, you know, it's August. It's hot. We're going along. We walk inside, and we're in, like, a Dr. Seuss winter wonderland they're baking, they're blending. I mean, the actual contest was going on while we were shooting the clues right. with Tamara Mowry, and she's trying to read the clues, and you hear blenders in the background, <laughs> you hear mixing, but we couldn't ask them to stop because that would, of course, be a disadvantage to them in the competition. So we did some, mm. some good post-production on the audio so that the clues don't have quite as much ambient baking sounds in the background, but fun category. Check it out. It's on uh, Amazon. Yeah. I, um, challenge. I also enjoyed in this one the uh, ooh, sorry. Uh, yes. Always oh, love an Alex. Yep. Yep. Ooh, double O sorry. Always love a mythology category as well. I mean, it's right down the... I do want to say I love the kind of more academic kind of historical mythology literature. So love to see that pop up again. All right, moving on to Wednesday with Ray Lalonde going for his fifth win, that all-important fifth win to secure a TOC spot against Mary Dishagrikian and Michael Vaz. Well, this was one where Michael really uh, 
gave Ray a run for his money, huh? Yes, he did. In the lead yes, uh, he did. with that Daily Double going into the Double Jeopardy round. Both each Ray and Michael had a Daily Double. Uh, Michael bet a little bit more and was really just $800 behind Ray going into final. Ray bet to cover Michael doubling up. But then Michael did a very small wager just basically to beat where Ray was going into yes. final by one dollar. Was Which it I a think was a smart, smart was choice. it savvy or was it silly? It's a uh, I'm going with savvy. It's a fine line and let me tell you, between savvy and silly is a tight rope mm. I walk every day. Ah, uh, the buzzy rope. <laughs> But yes, we could see how Michael knows that, you know, unless Ray gets it wrong, he's not going to beat him. So if he gets it wrong, then you got to bet on him missing. Yes. And the correct response was Charlotte's Web. Mm. Ray had spoken about how much he loves reading to his kids, how much he loves literature. So that was a good category for him. So, you know, this was a game Michael couldn't win. But boy, did he come close. Interestingly enough, in the postgame chat, Ken actually said, you know what? You should start your letter writing campaign for the second chance competition. And Ray says, I will write the letter. So (laughs) even Ray knows that he escaped that one by a narrow margin. I had a chance to talk with Ray right after he officially qualified for the TOC with that fifth win. Let's hear what he had to say. Ray Lalonde, you are now a five-day Jeopardy champion. Can you believe it? No, I cannot believe it at all. It feels very surreal right now, but... I'm sure it'll sink in soon. What are the emotions knowing that you're a five game winner and you're headed to the next tournament of champions? That's so far in the future right now, I can't even think about it. Uh, I mean, a little while back and I won my first game and I thought, that's it, I've done everything I wanted to. This is fabulous, I can dine on this for the rest of my life. I cannot believe you have an identical twin brother and not only do you share looks, but you share a love of Jeopardy? Yes. Well, we all, our whole family grew up watching the original Art Fleming version of Jeopardy. My mother was a brilliant person. We got all our brains from her. No, no, <laughs> no diss to my dad. Thanks, Mom. But uh, Mom was brilliant. And uh, so we would sit down every night and watch. And every time we went back home for Christmas, New Year's, whatever, uh, it was always on TV. And it was always something I associated with uh, being around my mom. And it was her whole life was her favorite show. We understand your brother is in the pool trying to audition to be on Jeopardy as well. Who started trying out first? I believe I did. I've done it a couple of times now, but this is the time I got through. And how do you think, if he makes it on the show, how do you think you stack up against each other? I want to say I'd beat him, but I couldn't, I wouldn't put money on it. He's a very bright guy. All right. What are his strengths over yours, would you say? Uh, Well, he's a medical physicist, so the sorts of things that were happening uh, the other game were, uh, you know, chemistry, uh, sciences, uh, he'd do very, very well. Well, we've had a lot of firsts in recent years on Jeopardy. We've never had two brothers compete in a tournament of champions. We know you're going to be there. We don't know if your brother will be on Jeopardy, but that, that'd be something for the record books. Yeah, it'd be kind of like, uh, you know, good and evil me fighting it out on TV. <laughs> Ken joked, how will we know that you don't put him in your place one of these days? Well, if you look very closely on HDTV, I've got a birthmark and he doesn't. And that was how everybody told us apart as babies going forward so all right now we know the secret certainly this has to be a great way to spend the holidays as a jeopardy champion unreal unreal this is the best party ever (laughs) well we look forward to seeing how your streak continues congratulations on five victories ray thank you so much fun to hear ray talk about his twin brother again i'm hoping at some point that we can get his twin brother in the audition pool i'd love to see lalonde versus lalonde maybe in the next toc it could happen all right we head into thursday we know now he's going to be in the tournament of champions but today he's facing mitch cutter and kathy boltzer ray came out of the gate really hot i mean 14 correct responses plus a three thousand dollar daily double nothing incorrect Finishes the Jeopardy round with eleven thousand dollars, and then continues that. However, mm, however, Jeopardy gets close. Gets a little bit closer with Mitch right on his heels. Here we have somebody who's going on a streak, but it's not a Chris Panulo. It's not runaway after runaway. He's he's continuing to have to play, and he's doing very well in final. Here is another one where he has to make a big bet, and he does it. And it's interesting that people in second place are are learning about this sort of betting to cover the loss strategy as opposed to just betting it all from second. 
Yeah, Ray really needed that late run in the double jeopardy round to get that lead. He goes on to win another day, but this is proving to be a little more difficult for him this week. With the exception of Monday's runaway, he's having to work for each and every one of these wins. He tells Ken in the interview he's he's starting to get used to the thought of being a toc -er. Gives a <laughs> shout out to his daughter. He's trying to wrap up the week now, going against Rebecca Triano and Artie Mendoza. Once again, I think, you know, Ray really does a good job of capitalizing on the Jeopardy round, which a lot of champs, including myself, maybe don't pay as much attention to, but he's really using it to his advantage. Gets off to a big start. R and Rebecca try to close the gap, but he's still in the lead. Gets fi only one to get final correct and finishes another week as a champion. We had a great category in Double Jeopardy. Ryan Johnson loves a whodunit. A lot of buzz about Ryan right now, of course. Knives Out, Glass Onion. Yep. Big movie right now. And I was thrilled I got to go on this shoot and have the chance to shoot with him. You a big Ryan Johnson fan? I am. I actually have been a Ryan Johnson fan since Brick is one of his earliest films. If you haven't seen it, I recommend it. It's a he sort of made a, a film noir mystery and with that kind of uh, very 1940s, you know, Humphrey Bogart snappy Sam Spade dialogue, but it's set in a high school with Joseph go. Gordon-Levitt. It's just a very odd, fun, weird movie. What was Ryan like? Well, he's a big Jeopardy fan. I think that's, you know, something I always love and adore. Real fan of the show. You know, I can't remember who the champion was at the time, but he was wanting to talk about them, and uh, he wanted to do the clues proud, present the words accurately. He was a great, I thought he was a great presenter. We were at his studio, kind of where he does his post-production, so right there yeah. in the room where they do the screenings. He's a it man who fun. loves clues. Exactly. Let's take a listen to what he thought about his Jeopardy! clue presenting experience. Ryan Johnson, you have spent plenty of time behind the camera, but what was it like to be on the other side? <laughs> this is the wrong side of the camera for me. <laughs> so, well, luckily, I had an excellent director, Sarah. Oh, thank wow. you for talking me through it. And I've watched a lot of Jeopardy, so I feel like the, I feel like the the way to kind of clarify what the actual question is. It's really specific and how you read it, and I found myself really naturally snapping into that. You really had the clue cadence down. <laughs> I can tell you've been watching Jeopardy for a while. I've been watching it for a bit, yeah. My wife and I watch it uh, almost every night, actually. That's yeah. great to hear. We love to hear we have fans of the show and of being course. able to feature them on the show. What was it like when you got the call and we said, we want you to do a category on Jeopardy? I was, I, yeah, blah, 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 blah. It was <laughs> insane. And, and uh, it, like I said, because I've been a fan of the show for so long uh, and because it seems like it, it's it's almost like it's so much cooler than even like scripted shows that you watch or something. It just seems like such a gilded sort of uh, amazing world that you I never thought I'd be on. So it's pretty, it's really cool. <laughs> well, we are excited to welcome you into the Jeopardy world, the Jeopardy family. Pretty thrilled. Pretty Great thrilled. job. Great category. Thanks, sir. All right, Sarah, thank you so much. That was a great interview. And now, speaking of clues, it's time for my conversation with the Clue Crew. It is my pleasure to welcome Jeopardy and Wheel of Fortune stage manager and original Clue Crew member, Jimmy McGuire. Welcome, Jimmy. Wow, th thank you very much. I must say, I am just thrilled to be here. I, the theater of mind that you guys create each week, because I'm a big fan of the pod. <laughs> Thank you for uh, listening. <laughs> first of all, where's Johnny? That's what I want to know. And there's right? a guitar. Where? He's playing the axe, I right? love that part. <laughs> but this is a thrill. Thank you. I'm flattered. And uh, this is really nice. I'm ready. You're ready. Okay. Well, one of the reasons that I love the podcast is getting to hear from not only the champions and our special guests who are reading clues, the celebrities, but also the people who work on the show and have created such a success and such a legacy with this program. You both joined the show in 2001. And for what I would call the dream job, the dream job, yeah, traveling around the oh, world, yes. shooting clues for <laughs> Jeopardy for more than two decades. And I'd love to hear about what you were both doing before you became a founding member of the Clue Crew. Well, I had a, a career in television. I always wanted to be in television. Uh, 20 plus years ago, I was working as a stage manager, believe it or not. Oh. Um, I had worked on some of the major talk shows at the time, uh, but at the time of the audition, I was with the Judge Hatchet show. Okay. And not only as her stage manager, but uh, her warm up guy. So I would <laughs> welcome, you know, all those people that would come yeah. to listen to 20 cases per day. And uh, it was my job to sort of get them in the mood, get them ready. Then, of course, you know, all had changed when I heard about the audition. 
And so you heard about it from your, your agent or someone like that? Or? No. The, uh, ironically, in addition to working as a stage manager, I was traveling with General Motors as a product presenter. Have you ever gone to an auto show? Sure. And those snazzy guys and girls that are by those uh, cool cars, I was one of those. And I was in Kansas City at the time, and I went back to my hotel room, tuned into Jeopardy, and sure enough, Alex did a promo. Hey, America. At that time, they were looking for four people to wow. travel the world and be part of this Clue Crew. Now, this is way before smartphones. Right. I didn't even own a computer at the time, but I wanted to at least download the application. So I went to the business center, right. downloaded that application, and as soon as I got home, uh, I filled it out, sent in a tape, and uh, things worked out. Amazing. Sarah, how about you? What were you up to when this all came about? Well, I majored in broadcast journalism at USC, as we've discussed. So I was working in northern Michigan as a news anchor way up there in Cadillac, Michigan. And essentially, one of my coworkers came in and was talking about this job. And I had only started my time in Michigan very recently. So I had I had some time to go on my contract. So I kind of secretly took a listen to what he was saying about mm -hmm. this job and I really couldn't believe it existed. So shortly after, uh, I went to find it myself, and I secretly applied without anyone at the station knowing. <laughs> Amazing. Very furtive. I love that. So 5,000 people auditioned. Talk to me about what the process was like. We've gotten to the point where you've submitted your application. Well, at the time, I had no idea the volume of people that were going to apply, so that didn't even affect me until later. However, um, the process was you send in a tape, and then you kind of keep your fingers crossed and hope to hear back. And that's what happened uh, from the 5,000. And again, help me here, Sarah. It's been so long. They narrowed it down to 500. Or was it 500? Then they narrowed that list down to another 100. 100. <laughs> and then I think they narrowed it down to 21 people. That is correct. See, we still work together. <laughs> <laughs> and those 21 people uh, were um, uh, given uh, travel expenses to come to uh, the Sony Studios. We stayed at the Beverly Hills Hilton. Yes. Ooh. And uh, we, we went in. We did an audition. We read clues. Fans of the show know we used to do Brain Bus events. We actually recreated one of those. And then we were sent home. And uh, I made no friends. <laughs> this is, this is very accurate. <laughs> Jimmy was not there to make friends. <laughs> I, really, I, really, I was focused, laser focused. I wanted this job so bad. I didn't want to form relationships and get distracted. I was still working. So I traveled the next day back to New York where I was working. Sarah then told me after we had a chance to, to talk later um, that the whole group got together. They formed friendships and exchanged emails. I didn't even have an email address. <laughs> <laughs> he did not. This is true. We passed around like a sign-up sheet and Jimmy's uh, yeah. was like, I don't have one. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted no part of that. And then sure enough, I mean, it was the next day when I received the phone call from Harry, uh, Harry Friedman's office, excuse me. I was still nervous yeah. just talking about it now. And he said, hey, Jimmy, we'd like you to be part of this Jeopardy! Clue crew. And after he said that, I heard not another thing. And they gave me a bunch of details. And then I politely asked if he could please repeat some of the vital information. <laughs> yeah. uh, but that was really it. And uh, before I knew it, I was in Los Angeles, living in Marina Del Rey, and met my three new best friends, yeah. Sarah, Sophia, and Cheryl. Was anything different about your experience? Yes. So it started out with the tape I had to record, you know, a VHS yeah. tape. Yeah. I don't know if many of you remember those, but that's what we had to submit, a VHS tape. But basically, I somehow convinced the director of my morning newscast that I was making a video for my parents. I sat on the desk and I presented like I was, you know... Good morning, topping our news at this hour. The producers of Jeopardy are looking for a team of roving correspondents to travel the world and get paid. I said, wait, what am I doing reporting about this? I gotta go apply. And I came off the set and I flashed myself in a lawn chair in snow and I talked about the fact that I'm from Arizona. The production value alone. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. I'm from Arizona. I, I have never lived in snow. Like it started in October. At this point it was February. The snow was still on the ground. Like I gotta get back to California. And I showed some of the, you know, the things I had done in my reporting and anchoring career, some mm -hmm. of the adventurous things yeah. like cow pie bingo and other rattlesnake <laughs> roundup, things I had done, you know, yeah. really high class journalism. And then they had us present three sample clues. They wanted to make sure that we could, you know, pronounce things well. Yeah. And if we couldn't, that we would look it up in a dictionary or a dictionary. Dictionary, <laughs> as Alex Trebek used to say. And so, of course, I used our weather wall. If I was supposed to be in a science lab, I put a science lab behind me and I had a lab coat on. We were supposed to be at the Champs-Élysées. Jimmy remembers it well because we ended up going there years later and 
hard to believe that we had done it for audition. So I sent in that tape secretly. No one knew. Um, I remember the day when they must have sent out the initial round of callbacks. And the gentleman who I told you about, Chris Williams, who had told me about the job, he comes in and he says, oh, Sarah, I just heard from Jeopardy. And they were so excited to talk to me. And so I get off the anchor desk and I go and I check my voicemail. They at least had a voicemail back then. I have nothing. So I'm just like so sad. I'm like, oh, my goodness, I didn't get it. I good for Chris, but I didn't get it. So then he comes over about 10 minutes later. He goes, do you want to see the email? And, you know, this is before (laughs) smartphones and your emails just came to you. I was like, it's an email. So I'm like getting onto my, you know, Yahoo account as fast as possible. And sure enough, I did have an email as well. And I I actually had a pretty interesting story trying to get to Chicago where my regional callback was because, again, I couldn't tell anyone this was happening. So I had to anchor the news, the morning news, and then I had to drive or fly to Chicago. My mom was nice enough to buy me a flight from Grand Rapids to Chicago, but I had to drive to Grand Rapids and I had to make the choice to, there's like a fork in the road, like, should I go for the flight or should I keep driving? The flight was on time, so I went for the flight, but the flight ended up being late. I'm in the taxi cab, I'm singing my song I'm gonna do for my audition, you know, leaving on a jet plane. Don't know where this Clue Crew job will get. Anyway, and the taxi driver was like, I like the song, but you're wearing too much makeup. And there was nothing I could do at that point. And I'm calling the hotel desperately, like, please. I'm trying to try out for this Jeopardy thing. And I got this gentleman named Bill Godsmith, who used to work on our show. And he talked to the producers. And he said, if you can get here before they do the callbacks, the the next Next round of callbacks will let you audition. So I come tearing in. I run into another friend, Swampy Hawkins, who we worked yeah. with forever. Oh, wow. That's Swampy was that doing, part. like, the behind-the-scenes coverage for CBS Media Ventures. And I said, hey, where are the Jeopardy auditions? He's like, I think you missed it. Like, I'm like, oh, no. And no. anyway, I found it. I got a call back. But I must say, Sarah's production <laughs> value, terrific. Well, the one thing that I sort of <laughs> brushed over is that yes. I had been seen by the Jeopardy people Previously, Ooh. yeah, little yes. scoop here. Inside I, Jeopardy. Yeah, this is yeah, inside. this is breaking news. Or inside Jeopardy. They they were doing a kids version of the show that was called Jeff. Yeah, and I had managed to audition for that and did very well, but never received the hosting job. Who hosted Jeff? Bob Bergen. He's also the voice of Porky Pig. Yeah. Jimmy has his contact, and yeah. he can get you a good Porky Pig birthday <laughs> wish if you need. It's more inside, Jimmy. But, 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 <laughs> but long story short, I had been seen by the Jeopardy people. My tape, my audition tape, it was awful. Just I, I wanted to get it in as fast as I could. For those of you, uh, this is an audio uh, <laughs> thing, but Sarah is nodding along. Yes, I mean, and it's, it's, I, nod, I nod lovingly. Yeah. I mean, just myself with the camera. There was no weather boards. There were no songs. <laughs> yeah. But I, I wanted to bring dog. authenticity, <laughs> enthusiasm. You're kind of the Bruce Springsteen of the Clue Crew. Is that how yeah, you're... You know what? Even in my group audition in New York, which was crazy, they would bring us all in as a group. I looked around the room. There was a ventriloquist. <laughs> there was a juggler, a guy who did magic. One fellow had a big bag of hats. He would put a hat on and do a character. Then it's my turn. I thought, what the heck am I going to do? One, one thing that I think people who maybe aren't in L.A. <laughs> or New York and have friends who are auditioning for stuff is that, like, you know, it'll say, like, we're looking for a, you know, six foot three athletic guy. And if you're five, four and <laughs> out of shape, your your agent's going to try to get you to go anyway. Is that right. Right? So so even if it's like, hey, we're looking for a presenter for this thing. It's like if you if you want to be on television, pulse, <laughs> and you, well, your it's agent, daunting. It's intimidating. Yeah, yeah. And you're there auditioning in front of others. So again, I thought to myself, now it's time to really show up and let them know exactly how you feel. And my approach was, Mr. Friedman, what I bring to the table, you can't put in a duffel bag. I want to bring innate curiosity. I want to bring uh, loyalty and fun. You know, I just wanted to bring that across. And apparently I did. And uh, to this day, I still feel the same way. And it shows. I mean, you know, like (laughs) it shows. shows, No, it's true. I mean, you know, like I, you know. I don't want to say I grew up with you guys because I was already sort of a grown up when sort when of I had a clue, sort of a grown up. <laughs> but I, you know, I watch as a fan of the show. Let's say as a fan of the show, watching it was always exciting when the Clue Crew was doing something. And now, you know, when I was a contestant on the show, when you guys were in the studio, it was like so exciting. Oh. And now, oh. you know, with you warming up the audience, I think the enthusiasm is still there. Thank Speaking, yeah, Jimmy has many jobs. Yes, like he is also, as we said, he is the stage manager. He still does the warm-up. 
And the rehearsal games. And he's the host in the rehearsal well, games. It's fun. And I really, I had a conversation with Sarah. We had a production day yesterday. And it was a little, you know, crazy, but crazy good. A lot of moving parts. And at the end of the day, I see her as a producer and juggling all sorts of things. And we're really working right now. Yeah. <laughs> Not to so, say we weren't no. on the Clue so Crew, let's talk about yes. the Let's yeah. talk about the Clue <laughs> Crew era, yeah. if you will. You, you, you traveled to more than 300 cities, 46 countries, all wow. 50 states, all seven continents. What was your favorite destination of all of those? I'll just jump out. It's easy as can be for me. Uh, first international shoot, we went to Rome, Italy. And as a civilian, I've always wanted to go there. Probably, if I wasn't with the Clue Crew, probably would not have had a chance. And uh, it was amazing. And I joined the party late. And again, my, my international traveling experience was, was very limited. <laughs> and I met the team at the, at the restaurant. <laughs> and I know this story. I love this story. <laughs> this is so true. <laughs> the restaurant in Italy or the restaurant at the airport? A restaurant in, in, in Rome. We okay. had done a, a couple of cities, different before. crew members before. So Got Jimmy it. came to meet us. So as I uh, left the hotel, uh, you're given your key which is connected to what seemed to be like a ball and chain. <laughs> yeah. Giant and ball and chain. <laughs> I've only traveled in the United States. When you leave the hotel, you take your hotel key with you. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, I know where this is going. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> well, you're supposed to leave it at the front desk. Yeah. So I showed up at the table, uh, and Sarah and I would always, I'm like, hey, Sarah, like, what the what's heck? What's up with these what's keys, up with these man? Keys? <laughs> <laughs> and she said, you dope. <laughs> <laughs> So yep. that was the beginning. So these funny little, only inside stories that we yeah. have together. Uh, only six of us have done this job. Only two of us have done it from start to finish. And that's what I miss, to be yeah. honest with you. Some of the funny times and funny moments. But we're, we're keeping it alive still yeah. to this day. Sarah, how about you? What was your favorite destination? Well, I know it might surprise people, but it was Antarctica. Mm. Yes, that was my my seventh continent. So just to be able to travel there and to ever say you went to seven continents was unbelievable. But, you know, there's something really special about being somewhere that few people ever to reach. And especially yeah. in interacting with the wildlife, they don't right. see a lot of humans. So, you know, there were specific rules. We went there with National Geographic and Lindblad Expeditions, and they made sure to tell us when we went on land, like, you know, don't get within 10 feet of the penguins. But if right. you're sitting down and they approach you, like, that's okay. So there I was just <laughs> sitting down on a rock and this penguin came up, nibbled on my boot, looked me in the eye. And I just was like, how in the world did I get this lucky to have this job? And that was, you know, when I wasn't kayaking a month icebergs and having whales surface like fish. Yeah. It was just extraordinary. And my goal is that one day... I could take my kids somewhere like that. Like that would be the ultimate dream is to go back and experience it as a family. Well, that was your favorite place. Did you have a favorite single clue that you shot? Absolutely. And it's probably to no surprise of Sarah. I, I'm a huge football fan mm -hmm. and I'm from Pittsburgh. Again, I'm going to paint a picture of you every day that I've ever <laughs> seen you. You have uh, your ID on a Steelers lanyard. I'm extremely loyal to a this A gift from me team. because I know. <laughs> oh, that's right. This was a birthday gift. Yes. And I think Thank when you. Aaron Rodgers guest hosted, there was a little bit of tension around that, was there not? Well, to back up, yes. I <laughs> forgot that I was wearing my lanyard. <laughs> and I walked into the green room. This is even when he was on the show as a, as a guest. Okay. A celebrity a guest. Celebrity celebrity guest. Or a celebrity, celebrity contestant, yeah. And no one told me that he was in the green room that we frequent. And I walk <laughs> in and I'm like, oh my God. And like my inside <laughs> voice and my outside voice were just the same at the time. And I'm like, oh my God, it's Aaron Rodgers. Hey, man. <laughs> he goes, oh, you're a Steelers fan. And I'm thinking, how does he know? <laughs> <laughs> and sure enough, he, he, he handled my, my lanyard, and that's when I fell in love. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so your favorite clue you shot. Yes. We were in Pittsburgh, and uh, we had an opportunity to shoot clues with the Pittsburgh Steelers. Mm. And I was l a little kid. To, I still, I, I can feel the hairs on the back of my neck go up. One of my biggest moments, we would do cold opens for the show at the time. And we opened the show with, hey, everybody, I'm doing clues with the Pittsburgh Steelers. And I was with Mark Bruner, who was um, a, a tight end, and Charlie Batch, who was the, one of the quarterbacks. And Mark Bruner grabbed me. He said, yeah, Jimmy's a little guy. Stay tuned. Then I looked at him and I went, little guy. <laughs> After we stopped rolling. But, schmacting. Yeah. We call that schmacting. Yeah. <laughs> Ad living too. Yeah. But it was just amazing. So, But there's so many other things. Favorite clue. That's like asking you what's your favorite color of the rainbow. Yeah. Uh, there's so many. The access that we've had 
the sporting venues that we've, Sarah and I have been to the, the Lambeau Field in uh, Yankee Stadium, Churchill Downs, the Indianapolis 500. So there's just too many to, to really name, but Clues with the Steelers would be my favorite. How about you, Sarah? Well, I'm a big Broadway fan, and although I like to sing in the shower, I would never make it to a Broadway stage on my vocal talents. But because of Jeopardy, I was able to. We did lots of different clues on different Broadway sets, but the one that stands out the most for me was Wicked, and Mm. I actually got to fly through the air as Elphaba and hold the broom and deliver a clue as opposed to delivering that high note in Defying Gravity, (laughs) but... It's a highlight, and my kids have had to hear it, you know, when I've taken them to see Wicked Mommy once flew like Alphaba. But that was one of those. Like, I will never forget that opportunity, particularly because my skill set would never have allowed me <laughs> to do it in any other uh, way. <laughs> so what would what would go into making the video clues that you, you would produce? Well, a lot of behind the scenes. Yeah. I mean, it starts with ideas generated from the clue crew members, from producers, from the writers, the researchers. Really, a good clue idea could come from anywhere. And then it begins with, you know, reaching out to the location, seeing if they would like to have the clue crew and the writers generating the clues and all the process that goes back and forth with, you know, the location letting us know, yes, that will work. This is what we have. This is what you can shoot. This right. is what you can't shoot. And then there's so much additional work that goes into the clearances, the location agreements, the permits. It is so time involved. You know, for an eight second clue, we always joked, like what went into one eight second clue? And then coordinating all the travel, of course. And, you know, and then all the post-production, once all the clues come back, choosing the best take, getting the additional B-roll to put in each of those clues, you know, getting them into a game like, it was a delicate dance yeah. that a lot of people had a hand in. In addition to, obviously, the members of the Clue Crew, like, what kind of production team was traveling with you? How many people, you know, you're showing up at, uh, you know, Schoenberg Castle or whatever. It's a small and mighty crew. That was the whole point of the Clue Crew is that we had game material. So we couldn't right. draw a lot of attention to ourselves. So it was often two Clue Crew members, usually, just in case one of us lost our voice, which (laughs) did happen to Jimmy Uh once at a ski location. And bless his heart, he was gurgling and (laughs) doing everything he could, and he just couldn't talk. But there would be two clue members. There would be an audio, you know, a camera operator, a producer, and often like a lighting grip. Mm -hmm. Interesting enough, the clue crew never used a teleprompter. So we always memorized. To my detriment. (laughs) That is... We have strengths, we have weaknesses. Memorization is probably one of the most difficult things that I ever had to deal with. And with Jeopardy, there's no ad-libbing. There's, you know, every word pins a clue. Yep. And And is written by a union WGA writer. So you can't alter from that. Was there one shoot that was really challenging? Very, very (laughs) difficult. Uh, Sarah looks at me. I think she knows what I'm going to talk about. One thing, there's no question. Animals were always (laughs) something that I had a very difficult time with. Uh, I was bit by a dog as a young child, and my trust <laughs> with those animals who don't necessarily like to be held. Oh. Okay, no. it was always like, "Hey, Jimmy, you know, hold the hold the anaconda or um, hold the nurse shark," which is the first opportunity that everyone on the clue had a chance to see uh, my fear for animals. Uh, we were at an aquarium, um, and I was uh, shirtless, I must say, too. And that we, <laughs> yes, <laughs> but you think. You know, here I am. I'm already nervous as it is holding this nurse shark. Millions of people watch the Jeopardy program. I'm in waist high water <laughs> and a board short, per se. <laughs> I mean, the things that we did back then, I would never do today. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, compounding all this nervous yeah. energy, I couldn't do it. I was holding this, again, nurse shark. It's all but three feet long. Yeah, mm. but they don't have teeth, though. The but, size is debatable. All right, looks like a shark, Yeah. beady little <laughs> eyes, yeah. the fin, Yeah. and then the trainer's on hand and, and said, if it if it feels a little irritated, just drop it right, right in front of me, again, <laughs> in waist high water. So I, I made like maybe three attempts, maybe four, and then I uh, Rocky Schmidt was traveling with us at the time, and I looked at him and just to, for him to just say, you don't have to do it, and he said, I didn't, and uh, Sarah came <laughs> in for the rescue. Nurse sharks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Sarah, was that your hardest clue? Oh, no. Um, my most difficult shoot. shoot was with the Thunderbirds because mm. I got to fly with the Thunderbirds, which was incredible. But, you know, it's just me and the pilot up there. So yeah. I've got my flight set of suit. scripts. I've got my flight suit. I've got all the gear. And I am I have to produce the shoot from the sky. I have to say... Wow. 
okay, can you do the Emmelman turn now? Oh, my God. And then I'm, like, rifling through my script to, to try to memorize it quickly, you know, put my script down, look to the lipstick cam, and perform the clue while a very intense maneuver is yes. being performed. And this was the whole shoot. Okay, let's do barrel roll now. Okay, oh let's do. Oh my god! Mock I, have a, speed. I gotta, you know, while you're, you know, you guys have done so, so much amazing stuff. Is there, are there things where you're like, you know, I've seen this happen so many times. You know, I've seen, I've seen Top Gun a million times. I've seen whatever, you know, like some movie, some TV show, and then you, you all of a sudden you're doing it. And you're like, well, this, I was ill prepared for this <laughs> based on. Yes, no, I think I have a g- much greater appreciation for Top Gun because <laughs> the part of that story that's even worse is that when we got down to the ground, a couple of days later they said, oh, we're so sorry, the camera didn't record. Oh, oh my God. So you and had to do it again. So I had the opportunity to do it again. <laughs> but interestingly enough, they don't let civilians fly more than once with the Thunderbirds. So they weren't going to let me do it. And our producer said, I'll be honest, Sarah's the only one. Nothing against Jimmy, I but he's not happy. <laughs> you gave me the opportunity. I yeah. said, no, thank you. Sarah's the only one who can do this. So if you want the category in Jeopardy, we're going to have to put her back up. Yay! They said yes! Yay! Uh, uh, <laughs> Reminds me, Sarah has a, a story which I thought it was hilarious. We were in uh, Rio, and she was in a helicopter, and she had all of her clues, you know, in this little bundle, and the side of the helicopter was open, and they were circling Christ the Redeemer. And apparently, she lost all of her clues. So it's Just somewhere. one. Only oh, one flew one. away, but it flew <laughs> oh, out the window, the and it was like... What are you going to do? You know, our producer, Brett Schneider, oh, he loved a doorless helicopter. Like, mm. any time I had to do helicopter clues, he's like, can we take the door off? Because it's obviously going to make the shot right. that much better. And so it looked great for the shot, but very hard to hold on th- to those clues. <laughs> Somewhere in Rio, there's a Jeopardy yes. clue. Yes. <laughs> what would the be Check the chances? It. Yeah, Check next it out. week I'll be there. Or maybe this week. Try, to, on try, to, try to find it while you're there, Buzzy. Um, Sarah, there's got to be something that you know about Jimmy that people don't know because you have spent so much time together. What's something that our viewers would be surprised to learn about each other? Well, I don't think you would be necessarily surprised, but there's no way that I can describe the size of this man's heart and his love for this job. I mean, I we know, have I been, know that. As you a, do, someone but who I mean, I have been it, in the trenches with him in all hours at all places, and he's just always had a level of integrity that he carried throughout the time as a Clue crew member. And I know you can see it in the clues, but I had the privilege to be right with him side by side throughout it all. And there's no one finer to have been given this opportunity. And so to have him as your partner, (laughs) but to have him as your partner on this journey, like I couldn't have asked for anything more. And it's fun to look back at these memories, but honestly, these memories are what they are because of the person he is and who I got to experience it with. That is so sweet. I was hoping you were going to say something so embarrassing. I know. Well, yeah. he already kind of oh, copped to the animal uh, thing. <laughs> I mean, animal the fear. animal thing is really, there are so many times that he's like, Witty, you're doing this one. The Arctic <laughs> fox. I mean, there were a lot yeah, of, she, lot of animals. There wasn't an animal that she wouldn't hold. I was, <laughs> really, I wanted to hold a kitten or a puppy. Yeah. That was it. Yeah, I mean, you do have a Disney princess vibe to you, Sarah. Yes. How about, um, Sarah, you got something that people wouldn't know about Sarah, and you can feel free to embarrass yeah, her even totally though she was so me. sweet. Uh, let's be honest. To know Sarah, she, she's very open. She's an open book. She's very caring. She's dedicated. She'll yell at you if she doesn't agree with you. <laughs> uh, but you got to get through that. You know, she was the first person. I, I admit it. I mean, it, it, there were some times when I struggled with these long clues, and I sort of gave up my own confidence. And she would come to my room and, you know, say, hey, I remember this conversation. You're Jimmy effing McGuire. That's what she told me. (laughs) And like she said, don't you dare quit. And, you know, you're here for a reason. So she's so caring and does things. I mean, there's been some heartache in her life. And these are the things, you know, on, on top of being a fantastic mother, you know, I've gotten to watch her do that as well as produce this show. Uh, and travel, be away from her children. Uh, we would be in vans, and she would always make it a point to call home. There's a, a rough side, an outside, but man, <laughs> there's a really soft side inside. This is <laughs> such a love fest. I want to keep it going. And, you know, you both, speaking of love, had the pleasure of traveling with Alex. Is there an Alex memory that, you know, obviously everyone who worked on the show had a very 
you know, this is like a family. But traveling with him, as we <laughs> mentioned, it was such a smaller group. <laughs> and so you must have seen sides of Alex that even the people that worked with him here every day didn't see. What it, you know, is there is there a moment that you'd want to share with the fans that they might not know about, might not have heard about? I believe that we were an acquired taste with Alex <laughs> at first. You know, here's a man who what doesn't need us. Totally. And we are, are, are sort of just thrown upon him. And I remember the, one of the first times we not necessarily traveled with him, but we were in the same city with him in New York. And we appeared on The View. And the whole clue crew, were, we were gung-ho. We were in the van. And apparently Alex was going to travel in the van with us to the studio. <laughs> and then I saw, I looked out the window and I saw Alex uh, say something to one of the producers. And then he traveled by himself to the studio. But again, this is when we first started. Right. I'm going to tie this up in a little bow. <laughs> Sarah and I sp spent time with Alex many years later in Israel. And he made it a point, like made it a point that we would have dinner with him when he arrived. So maybe we weren't his first love when we first started, but certainly by the end, um, there was no one finer. And that dinner fell on a Friday in Israel. Right. A little tough to get a reservation, but we did find a spot and we were pretty much the only ones. It was Alex and Jimmy and I sitting at the bar and I remember he said... Yeah, he looked at both of us with yeah. this very serious yeah. look. And we were like, what's coming next? He goes, why aren't you two married? <laughs> and like, we what? both were like, what? <laughs> oh, no, Alex. We love each other. Like a brother, like a sister. Like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> ah, ah, like, wow. And he goes, not to each other. Yeah, like, he just <laughs> was really... You know, we spent so much time with him, and he watched us. And at this point, neither of us was married or had kids and that was such an important part to Alex of his life was his family so he was really concerned like I hope you guys aren't letting this dream job right. keep you from what really is the dream and that is having a family so he went on to explain that and it made a lot more sense <laughs> but you know he did live to see Jimmy get married he lived to see me get married he lived to see me have children he lived to see Jimmy have an incredible bonus, bonus daughter, daughter. Yep. Yeah, bonus and daughter. I think he felt very happy that we were able to kind of find it all in this really yeah. great dream job well in Israel again just to show you how much the taste was acquired by him in addition to the dinner he also wanted us to take a tour of Israel with him <laughs> and the backstory is I stayed up the entire night prior because the Steelers were playing <laughs> back to the Steelers uh, yes yeah. overnight so I stayed up having no idea I was going to be going on a tour of Israel with Alex the next day and <laughs> he gave us the time to meet him in the lobby. And it, once again, Alex is never late. I mean, oh, if no. you're on he time, you're late. Yeah. So Sarah and I, well, you know, we're not going to miss this. And the two of us met in the lobby and there's no sign of Alex. We're like, what the heck? And I'm like, you better call him. She's like, I'm not calling him. You call him. I'm like, I'm not calling him. <laughs> I'm not calling Alex. You call Alex. <laughs> and, and so apparently he fell asleep because he was tired. And then, of course, when he awakened and, and saw us, he's like, why don't you guys call me? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of being early, he was so known for being so early. And I remember we were shooting at Machu Picchu and our call time was, you know, two hours before his right. to kind of climb up a little bit. We were staying really close to the mountain, so we didn't have to hike any peaks or anything. But we made our way up to the clue location and it is thick fog. I mean, yeah. you cannot see your hand in front of your face, but we're kind of setting up as much as we can. And you know, it's an hour and a half before Alex is supposed to arrive. And here he comes, like, out of the mist, like, all right, we ready to shoot? And it's like, no, we can't shoot. You can't see. But that was him. He just, he wanted to get it done. He was efficient. But even in each clue, you know, he'd have his script, but he was he was going to produce those clues. Right. All right. What if I come through the window here? Right. What if I reveal myself? Like, he always had ideas. I thought you were going to tell the story when we were all going to Peru. And... They had that call time and you ever oh, slept? Oh, that time. Oh, my gosh. Okay. Yeah. Another terrible thing. We just talked about how early Alex is. Somehow my phone, well, actually my phone got stolen in Cusco yeah. the night before. And so I didn't have my traditional alarm system. I didn't set the hotel alarm correctly. And I get a call and they're like, where oh, are you? so bad. I was like, oh, no, this I'm is like, not happening. I'm uh, like, I mean, and I hadn't packed. Like I was not ready. So they had to leave me with Alex, you know, thinking I'm a delinquent. And I'm madly throwing my stuff in, and I they got some other car to take me to the airport. I ended up making the flight, but oh my gosh. talk about like seeing dad and knowing you have really let him down. That's what I felt that morning. Oh my gosh! Oh, I could feel the pain too because yeah. Harry Friedman was on that trip. Oh right, yeah, not just <laughs> not just Alex. Is there a place or a clue, or was there something that you wanted to do or was like you know slated to do, and it kind of kept getting held off? Is there something that you really wish had had happened? Had oh yeah! Uh, as a sports fan and living in Los Angeles and being a tremendous Dodger fan all of my life, even living in Pittsburgh, 
that's all I ever wanted to do. I wanted to do some clues from Dodger Stadium. And for one reason or another, again, as so Sarah close. Yeah. mentioned what, what it takes for a clue to be yeah. done, there's a lot of legal stuff and you know releases and all sorts of things. Sure. And it just never worked out. <laughs> yeah. How about you, Sarah? Well, I think, you know, I'd be lying if I didn't say there would be assignments that some of us would get that you, you know, of course you wanted to get sure. that. And one of the things I never had the chance to do was go on a USO tour with Alex mm. and with the team. And I, you know, he was such an ambassador for the USO and going and meeting those people and auditioning for the show. And he just was really committed to doing that. And I really wanted to be a part of that. And they did one tour in Japan in Japan and that one in particular like I I hadn't traveled to Japan and to have gone with Alex on a USO tour it just it would have been special but they brought back great clues great memories I got to hear about it but if I'm being honest that's one of those ones that I would have loved to have been hiding in Jimmy's mm. suitcase but I'm so glad you brought that up because this is where I would see who Alex Trebek the star he is. And and just as far as a human being, the military people, it was like you were traveling with the president mm -hmm. and the joy that w he would bring to these bases. It was yeah. amazing. And uh, I don't think we'll ever see anything like it. All right. That's it for today's show. We will be back next Monday for part two of my conversation with Sarah and Jimmy. Can't wait. All right. As always, make sure you subscribe, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social and follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube and on TikTok. And we'll see you all in the new year. Happy New Year. For more great Jeopardy videos, hit the subscribe button below.